Well, the theme today is uh, is basically the bottom line. What is the bottom line? Um, so, a quick reminder: we are specialists in small companies, both micro, small, and mid-cap funds in Australia. And four years ago, we launched a global um, opportunities fund, which uh, focuses on global smaller companies. So our bottom line today is that there's been substantial divergence in smaller companies uh, between value and growth, and between small companies and large. And just like our, I'm, I'm also the master of mixed metaphors, so I like to mix physics and chemistry occasionally, physics and investing and chemistry as well. Um, but just like the, you know, we think the laws of economic gravity will reassert over time, we think that there'll be a, a massive convergence over time between the performance we've seen between large and small. Um, and so yes, we saw Isaac Newton here with an apple falling on his head just to remind us what actually happens over time and that when, when the fundamental laws of um, economics reestablish. Um, this chart here gives you a quick summary of the performance of large caps and smaller micros. Now, there's two things to draw out of this chart. One has just been just the sheer underperformance of micro caps and small caps versus large caps. It's been a pretty dramatic underperformance. And secondly, it's just the length of time. It's a very long period of time where smalls have underperformed large caps. Um, so I'll talk a bit about why that's the case and then also perhaps where we're seeing some opportunities in small caps to, for that, that gap to close. <clears throat> just to give you a, a bit of contrast here and show you just how, how wide that dispersion between large and small has got over time and how favoured some of the large caps have become. Um, here's an example of, of a small cap company versus a large cap company. Um, the large cap company is well known, it's in technology, um, some of you might be able to guess what it is, and the small one is actually stock we own in our portfolios. So company A, which is a small cap, um, has grown revenue, organic revenue at 18% over the last five years, which is a pretty stellar number. Um, company B, which is a large cap, has grown 30, but, but a third of that was acquired. So on a sort of underlying basis, the organic revenue growth of both companies is pretty much the same. Um, in terms of equity raise, the small cap company has raised zero dollars in the last five years. In fact, it's raised zero dollars in the last 10 years and managed to achieve this incredible feat. The large cap company has raised over half a billion dollars to, to, to buy and make acquisitions um, to, to tuck in and try and continue, you know, continue that growth rate. Um, and the return on equity or the return on capital for the company A, the small cap, is 54%, which is a, st a stonking number for any company, um, whereas the large cap has been diluted down by all the acquisitions to, to a mere 23%. And despite all this, this difference in performance, organically and, and in terms of size, the small cap company can be acquired for, for 22 times next year's earnings, whereas the large cap company is trading on 100 times PE. So you've got to work miracles to get that, that, re that return from that level. So that's, that's how crowded some of these names are in the, small cap, in the large cap space versus small cap. Now, the small cap company is supply network, <clears throat> which we've had in, in our micro cap fund and is now also both our small cap and micro cap funds. What do they do? They're a, um, a bit like a back core for, for truck and bus parts. So they supply independent mechanics with bus parts and truck parts. Um, and they've achieved an incredible rate of return over that period of time. On the left-hand side there, you can see a chart that we like to publish. Um, this chart is actually in all of our models. And we compare the underlying free cash flow with reported EBIT. Um, this keeps out of trouble because we can, we can really start to see visually at least where there's accounting anomalies. Um, and we like, you know, we like business with a high cash flow conversion. So Supply Network's got a cash conversion rate of 66% over the last 20 years. Not a bad number. And all that excess cash has been going back into working in capital and inventory as it grows a business. On the right-hand side there, you can see the return on capital, which has actually expanded over time. So as they deploy money, um, the network effect is making the business more valuable and they're getting incrementally higher rates of return, which is pretty, pretty rare. You put more dollars down, rates of return usually go sideways or down, but this business is seeing an increase in rate of return, which is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and as I said, that business can be quite for 22 times PE versus many large cap names, which are um, you know, on really high multiples. The other area where we see pretty substantial divergence um, in, in the small cap space is with lithium. Um, everyone knows that lithium is a hot topic. Um, everyone will be driving electric cars in the next two, two microseconds. Um, and there's a huge demand for lithium, no doubt. Um, but what's interesting, though, is, is that there's been a big decrease in lithium, the lithium carbonate price. So that orange line there shows you uh, the lithium carbonate price over the last couple of years. It peaked at $80,000 last year, and it's dropped to $30,000 today. So there's been a massive sell-off in that, in, that, in that actual price. Um, and yet this blue line is the sort of weighted average um, market cap of lithium stocks in Australia. It's come back a little bit from the peaks, but still trading at very high levels. 
And one of the things we like to do is to compare our stocks with international stocks. So we, we have a global fund, as I touched on earlier. Um, some people have argued, you know, are we getting too distracted by looking globally? And we'd argue, actually argue that it's, it's the converse. We get good insights from global and good insights from local into global, and they, they kind of feed into each other. And if you look globally in the lithium space, um, you can see indeed there has been a sell-off of some of these stocks. So the bottom stocks there, Albemarle, SQM, and Tianqui, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, have all sold off quite materially in line with that selling off of the lithium carbonate price. Um, but in Australia, by contrast, um, the stocks Pilbara, Liontown obviously got a bid yesterday, again from, from Albemarle, um, Minres and Alcan have all held up really well. So there's a lot of money crowded into this space trying to get a return. We just argue that there's a real risk um, with that backdrop, especially if you look internationally where there's been a dislocation. <coughs> now, <coughs> one of the things we do when we look globally is to get a sense of how um, opportunities may exist with domestic names, and I'll come with that in a second, but why is there such a divergence, you know, divergence globally? Um, well, you can see that if you look at the Global Smalls Index and compare it to the Australian Index, there's just a huge number of stocks. Um, I mean, the, the index itself is to four, four and a half thousand shares, and Australia is only 200 shares. So there's just a huge tail of stocks to pick and choose from. Um, and the largest stock in that, in that index globally is only 20 basis points. Um, the largest stock we contend with domestically is about 200 basis points. So there's a lot more concern we have for the bigger stocks here. Internationally, it's so fragmented, we can just literally bottom up stock pick and find the best opportunities. <coughs> so to give you that, that again, in a sense, you know, there's 12,000 stocks we can invest in and that, that fit that, 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 um, that criteria globally. Um, and there's about 500 odd in Australia. So the market, when you go global, is, is about 26 times, 23 times larger. Massive opportunity for, for bottom up stock pickers. And we see like, really good parallels. So you saw Hyperion talk about realestate.com the day year before. It's a, it's a business everyone is aware of in Australia. It's been a phenomenal success here. Um, but if you look internationally, there's stocks like Zillow, which is the market leader in the States that some of you would have heard of. And maybe one you haven't heard of is, is called Hemnet, which is the, um, the leading property portal in Sweden. And it's got the closest business model to realestate.com.au around the world. Um, and if you go down the list, you'll see other parallels. So Hub and Net Wealth and Insignia, which everyone's familiar with domestically. Um, there's parallels in the UK with Hargraves Lansdowne. They're the leading platform operator in the UK. Um, and then in the States, there's a business called LPL Financial. And what you look at when you start comparing stocks internationally is you can, you can really see some, some massive anomalies. So Hub and Net Wealth, great businesses, no doubt, well run, taking market share over here. Um, that have multiples that are sort of two, three, in many cases four times greater than some of the, the peers internationally. Um, Ferguson and Reese, et cetera. And what we, the other thing we observe is just the multiple dispersion is huge. Um, so there's so much money in Australia crowding into some of these names. I flagged that technology stock before and that high, very high multiple, 100 times earnings. We see that in other sectors and other, and other stocks as well. Um, so for example, ProMedicus, another high quality um, medical imaging stock in Australia trading on almost 100 times earnings. Interesting that that wasn't the stock I was referring to earlier, but also on that magic 100 times PE. Um, we can buy stocks internationally like Napco Security, which is based in the States, growing at a similar kind of growth rate, around 20% per annum, um, for a multiple around a quarter of the price that you can buy in Australia. Um, and then other stocks you might be more familiar with, stocks like Altium, very high quality technology name in the mid-cap space, trades on 50 to 60 times PE. We, we've, we've got an exposure to a company called Zukun in Japan that is on about 25 times PE, and something like 40% of the market cap of that company is in cash. So very cheap business, growing at not a dissimilar rate to Altium, and yet trading on less than half a multiple. And so you know, we argue that this massive divergence we're seeing between growth and value, um, between some of these domestic names and some of these international names, we'll sort of see some convergence over time as money flows out of Australia. <coughs> And just to leave you with one example, um, globally, um, one of the biggest stocks we have in this fund is, uh, is actually a spin-off from um, ABB, and you'll get the pun in a second. Uh, Acceleron is a turbocharged business, hence spin, and um, they, they're the leading aftermarket turbocharger company in the world for large marine diesel engines. So when you think of those massive ships going around the world, um, those huge engines are powered by turbochargers. The thing about turbochargers is they have a really tough life. They get installed in these engines, they last 20 years, and um, <clears throat> they operate for about 5,000 hours a year, so they're really on the whole time. The tips of those blades spin at almost the speed of sound, so there's incredible wear on these engines, on these turbochargers, um, which is a great business for Acceleron because they, they sell the turbocharger, 
and then they have to maintain them. And so 75% of the revenue comes from maintenance. They take them out, service them, put them back in the engines, and they've got to operate. And they're absolutely critical for the functioning of the ship. Not only do they give power, they also materially lower fuel consumption and also reduce things like um, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, now that business um, is spun out of ABB, so it's not very well covered by analysts. Very great cash flow generation. So you can see from the chart here that the cash flow conversion has been almost 100% for the last decade or so. Um, it's not a high growth company, but it's a very high return on capital business, and then there's a very high recurring revenue stream with that servicing component. Now you can buy that stock for about 12 times EBIT. Um, small cap managers in Australia would fall over themselves to buy a stock like that on 12 times EBIT. Um, so that's sort of stock we think would be, would be trading on materially higher multiples uh, in the domestic marketplace. And yet when the money flows out and you go globally, you get much more opportunity to find stocks that are not as overpriced as we do see domestically. So just to conclude, you know, we are seeing there's been a big divergence between large cap, small micro caps in Australia. And we do see that as a massive opportunity for, for, for convergence over time. And there's been a big spread between value and growth. So the growth names in Australia, particularly some of those tech names, have really been bid up to very high, high prices based on um, a small market here, small opportunity set, and people have crowded into those names. Um, and we think that over time that will create a good opportunity for small cap investment. So with that, I'll hand it back to Mark. Thanks very much.